Hello, welcome to the Rural Poverty PowerPoint. This is Dr. Moyer for FCS 4840, Disadvantaged Family, and this is the talk on rural poverty. Before we can get into too much detail, we need to discuss the fact that most policies and programs that are created are modeled on urban areas. So this means that most of the resources that we have for people living in poverty were developed um, based upon what urban family needs, urban families need. I'm sorry for that. Um, and that doesn't bode well for the rural families because those needs are not the same. Uh, there are some, obviously some similarities, there's some crossover, and like all families need food stamps, for example, but um, there may be very different needs and if we don't address those, then we're not helping rural families get out of poverty or even try to get out of poverty. You have to look at the context that families live in. So for example, I have um, up now a slide that shows the differences between urban versus rural poverty. And you can see that they're kind of on opposite um, ends when we look at these different factors. So the first one, um, rural families are very tightly knit. They tend to be very close, um, not just families, but neighborhoods and people. Communities are very close and tightly knit. They know people. You may have experienced this if you grew up in a small town and everybody knows everyone and they might say, are you um, Katie and Bill's daughter? Or are you, um, I don't know. <laughs> Tom's cousin because you kind of look like him and I think I know him and you're thinking oh so annoying I can't do anything with anyone knowing who I am but on the other hand that tightly knit close community also provides a level of safety and support that you don't often find in more urban areas so on the other side the other column um, you'll see that for urban families they are more impersonal um, in urban communities they are more loosely coupled and you don't necessarily have that. Um, you may not recognize Katie and Bill's daughter um, unless they happen to be neighbors, but you know what I mean. When we look at demographic characteristics, uh, rural areas or rural communities are more homogenous, meaning they are more alike. Um, there's not as much diversity. And with urban areas, you do have a lot of demographic diversity. So it's not unusual to find in a small town in Illinois, um, there may not be any families of color living there. Um, there may not be any Hispanic families, any African American families, any Asian fam Asian American families, um, or even American Indian families. It may just be a whole community of white people, or at least what looks like white people. Um, as you know, is race for real, you can't always tell by looking. And so it appears to be a community of people that look exactly alike um, and tend to think alike. Where in urban areas, there is more heterogeneity and you do find diversity in regards to not just um, race, ethnicity, but also in age and religious background, um, also in sexual orientation, um, ableism or disability, um, just much more diverse communities. If you compare the values, you'll find that rural communities tend to be more traditional, where urban communities tend to be more liberal. Um, rural communities are much smaller, there's fewer people. Urban areas, um, a lot more people, larger density. The seasonal orientation versus time clock orientation with a rural area you find that the schedule operates around the season that is people are living in um, and some of the changes that come with the seasons like the weather, um, like the time change that occurs and the kinds of jobs that can be done under certain conditions. Um, for example, like the farming, you can only, I shouldn't have said the farming, that sounded weird. <laughs> farming in general, um, certain times of the year you can plant um, certain times of the year you can harvest and so families tend to operate around that seasonal orientation 
regardless of whether they are actually farmers or not, there's still that community is affected by the seasonal orientation. Where with an urban area, it's a more of a time clock orientation, tends to revolve around the typical business work day, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, that doesn't mean that that's when everybody works, but that's kind of considered the, the work day or the work time, um, even if you don't work that particular time. So the orientation is different. In rural areas, there are far fewer social resources than there are in more urban areas. Um, and this isn't just in regards to the types of resources used to assist families struggling with poverty, but in general, there are just more in urban areas compared to rural. In an urban area, you're more likely to find museums, um, you're more likely to find more movie theaters, um, post office, grocery stores, gas stations, department stores, etc. In a rural area, you might be fortunate to have a country store that also has a gas pump, um, and that might be about it. So, just depends, of course, on the area, but in general, rural has fewer. In rural areas, families typically have to own vehicles of some sort, cars or trucks. Um, with urban families, the public transportation's available, so many don't own a vehicle at all and have no need to. In rural areas, there is a greater negativity towards welfare or any type of government support. Um, where urban areas, you see a greater acceptance of welfare and government support. And this, of course, whenever I'm talking about averages, I never mean everybody. Um, but in general, that's what the research shows us. So rural families are more likely to say, no, I don't need help. I'm fine on my own, and their pride might interfere um, with them accepting any assistance at all, where you're less likely to find that attitude in an urban area. Um, and that's can affect how people view welfare. When I know when I have a classroom that's divided with some rural and some urban students, um, when they talk about welfare, they talk about it very differently because it depends on, on where they grew up. Then, um, as far as age, the elderly tend to, if they grew up in a rural area, they tend to stay there. Um, that's where they retire, that's where they live but youth tend to move out of rural areas in today's society because most of the jobs, the career opportunities, etc., are in urban and suburban areas. So you'll find a greater percentage of elderly and older adults in rural areas compared to urban. So those are some of the major differences, um, important differences, especially when you're thinking about the kinds of resources that are needed. And so we'll look at transportation, for example. You may not need um, a bus to go around and pick up people that don't drive um, and bring them to their appointments in an urban area because those things already exist. You have buses, you have subways, um, you have trains, you have ways to get around. But in rural areas, if you don't own or drive a vehicle um, or know someone who does, then you can't get around. And if you're not able to walk 10 miles, um, which oftentimes older adults are not, then how are they supposed to get to their appointment? Um, there may not even be cabs available. Many rural areas don't even have taxis. It's unheard of um, because they would go out of business. Nobody would use them. And so it's, it's difficult. So you may need a resource living if you're trying to help rural families. One of the things you may have to look at is how will you get services to them or how will you get them to the service? If you notice outside of Clem Hall, you'll see a child care resource and referral van that actually goes around and visits child care facilities. Um, and that's because we do live in, an, in a rural area and oftentimes you have to bring the resource to the people rather than having them come to you to get it. So that's just one example. Um, environment impacts development. and. Poverty is not a positive or a happy environment. So we haven't really maybe talked about this explicitly yet. We have touched upon it a little bit in the beginning of the semester. Um, poverty, what I mean by this is that poverty is not the type of environment that supports brain growth, that supports um, safety, love, 
health and wellness, economic self-sufficiency, um, comfort, etc. It's an environment that produces chronic stress. And so as such, it's an adverse environment and we have to find a way as family and consumer science professionals in whatever um, career trajectory or path we decide to take, we have to think of ways that we can help families living in adverse environments to improve, um, to do better, to live the best life that they can. And so it's not, it's not just about going into communities and saying, look, here's um, $100,000 and just do divide it up among the families living in poverty and that should do it. You can't undo those years of damage that have already occurred. Um, I hate to say damage, that's really not the word I'm looking for, um, but you can't undo the effects. That's, that's really what I mean. And you can think about this like a game, um, maybe a Monopoly game, where you're playing a game and halfway through you, you really want to start over because you're not doing well, <laughs> but you really can't because that's not part of the rules. You have to live with what you've got now, the decisions that you've made. Um, you can think of poverty like that. So you can't just bring in money and wipe the game board free, clear of all the pieces and start over. But you can give somebody money and maybe they can try to purchase more houses. Um, but then they still don't have the income necessarily to pay all the taxes because people are owning hotels. So I'm making this point to help you try to understand that it isn't about changing that environment to um, a great positive environment, but rather... How can we help families do the best they can in the circumstances that they are living in? And in the case of rural families, how can we assist rural families, provide resources for them that will help them make their life easier um, and make, hopefully, reduce some of the negative effects on development? Poverty in the brain, more specifically, so looking at um, and I, I bring this point up because when I'm talking about how it's hard to undo the effects, really what I'm talking about are effects like this, not just, oh, I had to live in hand-me-down clothing my whole life, so now I, I like to live in brand new clothing. Um, and that may be the case for somebody, but that's not necessarily like devastating. Where chronic stress and chronic instability has an impact on the body that can be um, carried out through life and affect the person into adulthood and e affect their health and wellness for a long time, if not forever. So chronic instability adds chronic stress. And when you think about instability, to feel stable, you have to be in a position where you feel like you can pay your bills, where you feel like you're, you're comfortable, you don't have to worry about the future, you know that you're going to be eating your next meal, um, it's going to come. You don't have to worry about, is, but will I have one? Um, the car is running well. You have a decent vehicle or you have access to public transportation so you can get around. If we're talking about families in poverty that are living on the edge, that means that they oftentimes don't have that stability and that increases the stress that they experience. That stress impacts the body in a negative way. It affects the digestive system. It affects the brain in regards to serotonin levels. It affects impulse control, decision-making, and it affects the immune system. And so it increases the likelihood of depression, anxiety, impulse buying, decision-making, poor short-term memory development, physical illness, and disease. That's what I mean when I say you can't wipe the slate clean because the effects of chronic stress, they, they leave a mark on the body, they affect the body, um, and it isn't something you can just snap your fingers and, and make it go away, <clears throat> particularly just by handing somebody money. And it's hard being poor in rural areas. It's not easy. Um, I would argue that it's a struggle that few people understand unless they have grown up or lived in a rural area. Um, if you have only lived in suburban or urban areas, it's just difficult to, to understand and comprehend what it's like to live miles away from people. Um, 
and I chose the picture of the background that I did for this PowerPoint to emphasize the point I'm trying to make because it can feel very isolated. And without the resources needed to get out or to even do better, that makes it much more difficult to get out of poverty and escape it forever. And then there's the earning tax. And the earning tax doesn't just affect rural families. It affects all families living in poverty. But it can be more difficult in a rural area where there are fewer resources to help kind of overcome this deficit. So the earning tax refers to when families make just enough money that they no longer qualify for aid like Medicaid, um, heating or um, child care, housing subsidies, food stamps, or even cash, um, et cetera, some type of support from the government. And if they don't have that help anymore, those in-kind benefits that excludes um, cash but includes everything else I just mentioned, then they can oftentimes be worse off. So now they no longer have health insurance because they've lost their access to Medicaid. Um, they no longer get an extra 200 in food stamps every month. So the groceries that they have to buy already were maybe not great, but now it's even worse because they don't have any assistance. They don't get that extra heating assistance, and so they may not be able to even heat the house um, on a regular basis at all. Um, they don't have child care assistance anymore, um, so they don't have either reduced rate child care or assistance paying for it, and so they may not even be able to afford child care, which can interfere with an adult's ability to even work. So they're actually, we, we call it the earning tax because it's kind of like, now you're earning more money, but you're being taxed in this way. And that's a problem that, like I said, affects all families living in poverty. But if you're living in a rural area where there are fewer resources in the first place, um, fewer sources of social support, then that makes it even more difficult. So if you don't have access to food stamps anymore, maybe if you're living in an urban area, you can still access soup kitchens or food pantries that live, that, I'm sorry, not live, but are within walking distance from where you live or within assistance um, taking, within, <laughs> let me just start over. You're able to get there because of public transportation. But if you live in a rural area and you already have trouble with transportation because you don't own a vehicle and you've been cut off from food stamps because now you're earning too much money to get them anymore, maybe you don't even have a food pantry in your town. Um, so what are you supposed to do? That, that's the point I'm trying to make. One of the points that your textbook makes, and I will try to help you to, I'll walk you through this, try to help you understand this, is, and it's not really something that people like talking about. We never like talking about power and privilege. It tends to make people that have power and privilege feel guilty about it, um, which is not the point of this lecture, by the way. Or it can make people resentful of those that do have it. The point I'm trying to make here is that families that have power and privilege within rural areas, oftentimes, they're in a position oftentimes to help the community, but they will often use their position to maintain the privilege that they have. Um, so how does this happen? What, what are we even talking about? As you probably already know, social class is determined by wealth, power, and prestige. And so oftentimes the way that you grow up in wealth or you even have access to wealth is through your family, parents. You're born into it. Um, so people are not born into equal economic circumstances and they're not born into equal um, race, ethnicity, um, race or ethnic circumstances either. And that's, we have talked about that when I had Dr. Ludlow come talk to you guys and you did the is race for real activities. Um, we talked about how it's, it's just not an equal playing ground. Wealth is passed down generation to generation. Um, it's difficult to obtain if you don't come from families with money because you don't have that extra support that you may need. I often hear people say, well, this is America and you can start a business. Um, you can, you can do anything you want. You can buy a restaurant, you can start over and you can be rich. Well, um, really? Because I know if you walk into a bank and you don't have anything, you don't own a house, you don't even own a vehicle, 
and your family doesn't have money and you don't have a co-signer, a bank's going to be very reluctant to say, sure, I'll give you $500,000 to buy that restaurant down the street. Um, Because they're worried you're not going to make it. You need that backing to be able to go through the rough patches and be a successful restaurant over time. So really, um, not trying to paint a bleak picture, but it is difficult for people that do not grow up in wealth to become wealthy and to get ahead. Um, if you look at, so Donald Trump, I always look at Donald Trump, or or even um, sometimes I, I think about the Kardashians too, and I shouldn't use these examples, but it just helps to understand. So do you think that um, we have Ivanka Trump, right, the daughter, and so she is able to start her own shoe line. So now she, there is a shoe line in her name, and that's great. She's making money off that, whatever. But if she didn't, if she her last name wasn't Trump and she wasn't Donald Trump's daughter, would she have been able to do that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, depends on what uh, other circumstances she would have. But certainly having wealth to back you up helps to increase more wealth. Okay, so I'm done with that part of it. The next point about that, though, is that the people that run for public offices and enforce and make the rules for a town and a community in a city are often people with money because they're the only ones that are able to carry out an effective campaign. So, you know, we sometimes have these grassroots campaigns where the you know somebody that didn't grow up in wealth and wants to run for mayor and they have fundraisers and they try to raise some money and get this person in office, but it's very difficult to go up against somebody else that has this huge campaign fund and is able to use that those resources to advertise more um, and to create situations or host events that you're just not able to if you don't have that kind of campaign money. So typically the people that maintain, develop, and even enforce the public policies that guide our families are the ones that live in wealth and that can be a bitter pill to swallow sometimes because how can somebody that lives in wealth or grew up in you know, a very comfortable situation understand what it's like to struggle and that that is you know one of the biggest problems that people say today it's and it's not just with local towns also we when we look at big government you start bringing lobbyists, and how do you have a lobbyist? Well, they have to be paid, and only the wealthy can afford to have lobbyists. So, ugh. anyways, money can be difficult. But again, I'm, I'm going off track. So, if it's the people that are wealthy that tend to maintain and, and create the policies, they're certainly not going to create policies that are um, detrimental to their lifestyle. So, for example, they're not going to say, okay, only people that are living in poverty can park close to buildings. Everybody else, anybody that has, you know, makes more than 20000 a year now has to park far away. Um, that's probably not going to happen, right? I mean, it's a little unrealistic. There might be some parking spaces set aside for, you know, a couple of families or, you know, this is kind of a ridiculous example, but you get my point. Um and the wealthy tend to hang with the other wealthy, marry other wealthy. Um, they can recognize one another by their speech patterns, their dress, and the, the people they hang out with, the social circles. Um, and so it's it's difficult to tap into that circle and, and get in there and really, you know, bend somebody's ear and talk to them about, look, here's, here's what's really going on. So it is hard. Um, and I just want you to understand that I'm not accusing people with power and privilege of trying to create policies that make sure everyone stays poor. What I am saying is that people with power and privilege are the ones that do develop policies. And oftentimes it's difficult to consider other perspectives when you have not had any direct experience or know someone that does. Okay, enough about that. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Um, okay, the last point that I want to make about rural poverty is that it can be a very isolated type of experience. 
Um, it is why I chose the background that I did for this PowerPoint, the, the single house on the prairie um, near a county road, because people do tend to live miles and miles apart. Um, it isn't a dense population with a lot of people living there. It can be hard. Um, it can be a struggle. And I would argue that it's much more difficult to get out of poverty if you are living in a rural area compared to an urban area. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that, our job as family consumer science professionals is to make sure that that problem is visible so that we don't brush it under the rug and that we think critically about what kinds of services and resources and support that we can bring to community, rural communities that actually will help. Um, beyond just, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to host a cooking class in the area for um, this, this rural town. And then we're going to learn how to make chocolate chip cookies and a big Italian meal. And well, that's nice. But if the family can't even afford to make that, what is the point of learning that skill? Um, a more practical skill might be, I'm going to take, get um, these classes in the community that teach people how to shop on a budget how to stretch their dollar, and how to cook nutritious, delicious meals th without spending a lot of money. That's going to be a skill that's much more practical, doesn't use a lot of you know, crazy, fancy ingredients that people don't have. Um, and you have to think critically like that. You can't think, a lot of times people think, well, this, this is surely going to help them. But you've got to remember that we have to have our basic needs met before we can attend to our higher level needs. Um, of course, I'm referring to Maslow's hierarchical needs theory. Um, if we don't have a place to go to the bathroom and we don't have food to eat or water, clean water to drink, we certainly are not concerned about getting our education and living to the you know, to our best ability that we can. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. That's all. Thank you for listening.